Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the Event Industry News Podcast. My name is James Dixon, and as always, I wish you a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever and wherever you tune in to today's podcast from. Um, and on today's podcast, we welcome the founder of a, a company called Totem. Totem launched its own hybrid events platform in 2020 with the aim of reimagining virtual events in the wake of COVID-19. Joining the podcast today, I'm delighted to say, is the Chief Creative Officer and Co-Founder of Totem, Christopher Bow Shields. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, James. How are you? Very well, thank you. In, in the midst of setting up um, in the Event Industry News HQ for our virtual Event Tech Live USA and Canada next week, so I'm in a, a, a different setting again um, with a laptop and the mic set up in the midst of a lot of jiggery pokery at the moment of, of, of cables and uh, internet connections. Your, uh, I'm sure your own setup, Chris, is far neater and more organised at the moment. You, yeah, um, you wouldn't think so if you could see what the camera can't see. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, the joy of a camera angle. Um, so th thanks for joining us the, uh, on the podcast today. And as I said in my introduction there, um, you guys launched your own hybrid events platform in 2020, very much, you know, uh, as part of this whole process of reimagining what virtual events and what events full stop can be in the wake of, of what's gone off in the last year or so. Um, give us a little bit of the background, first of all, about your own professional, personal background in the industry and, and Totem prior to this launch of your own platform last year? Sure. So my background, if we're going to wind back many, many years, uh, was in theatre uh, as a, a technician in theatre doing lighting and sound. Uh, I then drifted into sort of corporate events, sort of chasing uh, the slightly higher uh, fees you could command in that industry, as it were. Uh, and I started a production company about 20 years ago, uh, mainly in an audiovisual uh, capacity. And then we started producing websites and drifted more into a media comms sort of agency for events. And then uh, four years ago, we built our first bit of event tech. So we built a platform called uh, Banumi Pro. It's uh, 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 an app that's powered by a bit of kit. So you have a, a box that gets uh, sent to you as a client. Uh, in that box mm. is a frame that holds your mobile phone, uh, a professional microphone, uh, and a light. And basically, through the app, you can film live into the cloud. Um, it goes up, you can set up edits, it goes up into the cloud. We have a team of editors working 24 seven who turn that footage around, brand it up for you, get it ready, and you get it back. And you can moderate it on the app, make your changes, and you get your social media or your content back the same day. So we, wow. that was our first sort of piece of tech, tech we built uh, and we put a dev, a dev team together for that. And that was in response to clients sending us, we were doing lots of traditional video shoots and lots of video, but clients were sending us more and more stuff that they shot themselves on their phone. Mm. And uh, we thought, well, rather than sort of uh, sort of talk them out of it, let's, let's you know, weaponize it for them. Let's give them a platform that allows them to really sort of use it and, and take away some of the edges of what was clunky with the tech, you know, wobbly phones and, and bad sound. It's always bad yeah. sound, I'm sure you appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah, and that's gone very well. So uh, that was uh, gone great guns. Uh, and then just as we were sort of pushing that into a, 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 into a sort of next big marketing stage, sort of the world collapsed, as it as everyone knows, last year. And uh, we started thinking about uh, what we should do. And a lot of our clients were talking to us. They sort of leaned on us for sort of technical expertise. And they were saying, well, which platform should we use for our events? Uh, we tried all of them and we sort of messed around. We helped clients on different platforms, used all the ones you're probably familiar with. Sure, uh, yeah. Although they're all brilliant and, uh, you know, uh, um, not not all, they sort of all seem to do one thing really well. And and also clients were sort of, they spent, our clients spend a lot of time and money sort of making their events very unique and individual, but then they're expected to sort of have a very sort of homogenized virtual presence all the events were sort of looking very similar yeah. you know logo top left everything looked the same and uh, and there was nothing out there that sort of made us feel that the client could express their event in the same way that they were used to doing yeah so we took the decision as we had the dev team um to basically create our own um so we sort of held hands with a few clients along the journey and we said we sort of showed them what our vision for this was uh, for totem um, we shared really early storyboards and, we, uh, and took some clients with us and we went into a really rapid prototyping uh, phase where we were working at a, a break uh, speed, um, sort of setting up failing fast, setting up failing fast, getting the, the platform up and built. And we managed to get the platform up and running in eight months um, using a team of UK devs, which are, uh, work, work for us. And we have a team out in India as well. And uh, yeah, we launched the platform last October. 
uh, and it's going really well. And it basically is just a, a reimagining of it's sort of a retrofit of an existing piece of technology. It, it was very much an answer to what was going on at the time. Uh, it was giving clients a real sort of sort of modular blueprint where they could just brand it themselves. They could call it whatever they wanted to call it. Um, it can. It's very scalable. You can turn all the functionality on and off. Your top nav can be completely controlled live. You can do m lots of different broadcasting through it to move people in and out of sessions. Mm. You have a teleporter in the system as well, so you could teleport people from one session into another session or into a meeting. Right, okay. We really started at the beginning and just sort of tried to plug the gaps of what we thought of how to bring the sort of in-person feeling back into an event whilst sure. allowing people to express everyone events differently you know some event could be with, with 10 people some could be with 10,000 so how could you use one familiar environment to express your whole portfolio uh, portfolio over and that's what we set out to do and it's it's interesting because the, the the paradox of course of these platforms is that um they take so much expertise and so much technical knowledge and so much you know development in terms of the coding the development of them the, the building of the platforms but ultimately I suppose the end game is always to make something as simple as possible for the end user to actually experience and use. So it's a weird one, isn't it? That you've got to put all that time and effort into an expertise into developers and something that the back end of which is very, very complicated, but ultimately that serves quite a simple purpose. And I think it's important not to get from experience. My advice would be it's important not to get lost down the rabbit hole of how many different functions and tricks you can add to it. Um, I don't see you nodding away there. You're singing from the same sheet. Um, absolutely, uh, you know, the, the, te the technology is an enabler. Your event is the key. You know, your content is the key. That's what's made you successful to this point. You know, you just need to use technology to enable what you do so well already, and that's the, really the way we looked at it. And um, and also using some visual cues from just things like from existing events to help the journey for the delegates through. We have something called Badge Builder, so you basically start your event by building your badge, and it's a physical badge that brings you into a profile. Your profile is always with you. We sort of noticed that a lot of uh, engagement was dropping off on other platforms because people were becoming voyeurs of events rather than participants in events. So what we did is we created a sort of profile that stayed with you along the sort of left-hand side for all your journeys, sort of towering above you, which which enabled people to feel like they were bringing their professional self to the to the events. You, you were very much there in the, in the interactions you were having. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you. You know, the, the, it's easy to have sort of a bag of bits and a bag of tricks, but how you know, simple is very hard, you know, and you know, making something simple to use and simple to engage with and, no matter how complex you make something, a user journey could be for one event for one hour. You can't trip people up with technology and complex processes. You have to sort of lead them by the hand. So, Yeah. And when it comes to leading people by the hand, you know, we, a lot of people were being led by the hand slowly but surely pre-pandemic. And I've said this many times on the podcast since I, I, I started back in, in, in January after a bit of a break last year is that um, we were leading people slowly by the hand. The pandemic accelerated people's need to really explore virtual options. For a period of time, it was, well, we'll just have to make do with this until we get through this period of time. But pretty quickly, it became apparent that making do with this for the next period of time actually is, oh, that this could be something actually that sticks around long term, you know, and and and, and that's, that I think, without, you know, being too broad and sweeping a brush right across the entire industry, I would say most people have accepted that some events will stay virtual or will stay hybrid because they proved actually to be a little bit better. Yeah, we, we, we it's interesting you, you describe it that way. We call that sticking plaster to strategy. So people mm -hmm. like sort of went straight out and to get the sticking plaster to fix an immediate problem. They needed to get online. They needed to get their events out. Um, but then, uh, they, yeah, as yeah, everything unfolded, I mean, it's, it's probably boring to dwell on what's happened last year too much because of the, you know, everyone yeah. talked about it so much. But yeah, people, as the goalposts kept moving of COVID, people's strategy had to start changing. And then they realized, well, this is actually probably here to stay. And actually, we are having some successes here. And then some of the clients we're working with have, like, you know, generated whole new um, portfolios out of this. Um, mm -hmm. And as much as you sort of 
it's easy to concentrate on the bad and what we've lost if you know it's if we concentrate a little bit on on the positives and what you've gained so you've got the gaining of data so yeah. we 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 built a whole um, system in the back end called Heartbeat, which measures where anybody is at any point every seven seconds in the event, and that gathers all that data, which is very very useful for people to plan their events and understand what was relevant and what was working. Um, uh, that so uh, data is a really big point. Also, the ability to sort of rapid prototype. You know, if you book a physical venue, you might be booking it a year or six months in advance. The logistics involved in doing that. Whereas, you know, with the right technology, you can spin an event up in a day. You can try an event. You can see if it works. If it doesn't, you try something else. You can A B test events. You've never been able to do that sort of thing. And I, I think yeah. some of that uh, is brilliant. You know, and, and I think some clients are really embracing it. Well, look at the scalability that you've got straight away. You know, if you, if you book a venue for a, a first time event, you think, look, we think we're going to attract 500 people. And then you suddenly get interest from an audience that you think you could easily sell 2000 tickets to. Then straight away, you're presented with that problem of having to find an alternative venue. Um, oh. And of course, it, it, very few event organizers want to turn, a re turn away revenue and turn away audiences. It's great to say show sold out and have a few people that can't come, but from a scalability point of view, that's another huge tick, isn't it? That instantly you can go from targeting a relatively small audience to scaling that up to thousands of people with no real change to your infrastructure. Yeah, no real change to your cost either. You know, there shouldn't be massive differences in cost once you've got the, the right tech in place. You know, mm. um, it's the, the, the cost for the platform owners of, of the difference between like 10, 10 users and a thousand users is, is minimal. It's about just having the right sort of infrastructure that that's allows you to do what you want to do and also have the flexibility to be able to express a, a small event or a large event or turn a small event into a large event in you know mm -hmm. in minutes or hours or however you want to you want to do it. But I think the I think that you know the, the the virtual events are here to stay. Obviously everyone talks now about hybrid and, and like blended events and how how we move forward. I think that's really interesting and that, um, it's kind of like a, an almost defunct word hybrid because it, it it's almost an expectation now from people. You know, yeah, it should be yeah. part of the need and the expectation of of what people want to do. Yeah, people aren't going to be able to get to an event, but they still want to go. You know, mm -hmm. so an event should just be an event, and you should be able to offer that event in many different formats and be able to attend physically or virtually. To say you went to an event, you know, in the same way that you know people maybe not the last example was the best one, but said they went to Glastonbury, you know, yeah, people yeah. Have watched Glastonbury for years at home now, and they still feel like they're a participant of that because it's so well executed by the, you know, by the television. And I think it's going to be the same experience when you look you know, five years in the forward and you look back, people will talk about going to an event, but when, and, and it won't matter whether they were there physically or they were there virtually, it's still in attendance. Yeah. And also you look at the next generation coming through, they've only ever, Sort of communicated online. This is just normal for them. So, like, uh, it's not about building a strategy that's going to be the sticking plaster for the recovery. It's about building a strategy that you know enables the next generation who will just want to attend virtual and hybrid events or blended events in between. So, yeah, and uh, you, you, again, you raise a, a very key point there that that has been spoken about on the podcast in previous months, which is. We don't call a football match a hybrid event. We don't call it, a hi oh, I'm going to a hybrid football match. You know, no. I'm going to go to the match and then I'm going to watch the highlights on TV later on. You're just going to a football match or watching a football match. You know, um, that, that's been a hybrid event for years. And I think that's the best example that somebody it gave is. me. You, know, that. That's pretty good. <laughs> you, you, have an, you have an audience there in the stadium and then you have, you know, several million people watching at yeah. home on the, on, on the live broadcast. Uh, and we don't distinguish between the two. We're just watching the match. And yeah. I think you're absolutely right to point out that in in the next few years, relatively soon, we will just talk about going to events. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's an event. Are you going to Event Tech Live? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll see you there. Well, I'm going to be doing it, you know, virtual, but, you know, have a great time. Whatever. The challenge it, it will just be an event. The challenge with this is not going to be tech, uh, tech as in can you make a, a hybrid event? It's, it's, there's no rocket science to it. Uh, a real hybrid event is where you consider both audiences from the outset, whether they're blended or they're, they're physical or that they're virtual, but you, you curate your program from the outset, knowing that that's the understanding of what you're going to achieve. You're not going to create a physical event that you're going to live stream. That's not a hybrid event. That's something you're just giving access to a session or something. Yeah. So I think, I think that's 
fairly straightforward. I think where clients are going to struggle is how do you make a smaller event hybrid? Because there are technological costs involved. So yeah. the bigger events um, can spend their way out of this. So you can just put cameras in every room and you can you know, use the technology to its advantages. And uh, if you've got a good app in place that can allow the physical and the virtual to you know, talk to each other, do meetings, uh, you know, network, then it's just about how do you get the content out? You might have a, uh, an event that has like six breakout rooms. How, how do you do that? How do you go about that? So we're looking at solving those problems for clients as well of like, how do you make a small event? You know, just, just because an event's not a big event and hasn't got the same budget doesn't mean there isn't a requirement for virtual guests to join. Absolutely. But I, I guess, and I, maybe I'm leaning on an open door here, but you, you mentioned right at the start there that previous to, to Totem, you had Banumi Pro, which utilizes effectively the, the mobile phones that everybody's got nowadays, in which the cameras are great. It's just a case of knowing how to set them up correctly, get good audio into them. And if you can crack those two things, then all event organizers really have got the capability of, of having a camera set up. You know, on a, yeah. on a on a on a tripod. So presumably, there's some sort of tie in there where you know that element of the business may be able to sort of dovetail with what you're doing with Totem. Sure. Yeah, I mean, and that's exactly what we're doing. And um, we're we're putting together a, a kit called a Totem Go kit. It's mm -hmm. a very cheap, inexpensive Peli case with the, the the equipment in there that could be set up by the organizer. It links straight into the platform. It's very um, very simple as far as like audio in. Obviously, you, you get your sound engineer on site to give you a feed. Yep. straight in press the button you're then streaming to that stream online so and it's about i think sometimes clients sometimes trip themselves over too much about quality uh in the sense of it needs to be a three camera shoot we need it to be vision mixed and there's always a time and a place for that you know on your plenary sessions and stuff sure yeah but sometimes stuff just needs to be accessible and and i think people forgive uh certain quality aspects um if they have access to it and they understand it and the way it's been done is sympathetic to it I would rather see something yeah. I would see than not see it because it's not two camera angles or, you know, so. Well, I, I think we've got over a, a certain element of snobbery that was around maybe five, five six years ago, especially with, with, with AV that, oh, no, it has to be a, a high-end pro camera. You know, we can't just have an iPhone set up there or a handy cam on a tripod with a feed. You know, now we've got BBC news reporters with their iPhones held up you know, streaming via 4G cellular signal live from the US elections, you know, with yeah. a pair of with a pair of AirPods in, you know, and, and as an audience, we have accepted that that's perfectly fine. As long as you can see and hear the content, that's the key thing. Yeah. Not that it's a high definition, well framed, you know, focused image. If, 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 as long as you can see that report and hear them, they're I'm happy because it's serving the purpose. And I think we've got over that snobbery. And all our benchmarks are like UGC. It's all kind of TikTok and things that we're making ourselves. We all know that you know, the phone could be filmed this way or this way. It doesn't matter. As long as you're seeing what you want to see, you can hear it. Sound's always the issue with everything, as I'm sure you know yourself. You know, you can fix anything in post on, on video, but sound's hard. So Absolutely. just cracking that bit is the, is the thing to, 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 to look at. And, um, but yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing to look at for, for, is how do you sort of make any event hybrid? How can you give that true access across mm. your portfolio when your events are smaller and larger? Because there's still a, there will still for some years to come be a requirement for people to want to attend virtually. Yeah, and um, it's interesting when we go back to the point about um, you know accepting that they are they are here to stay. This what what many people saw as a short term fix, while the live stuff came back actually open Pandora's box, the reality set in that actually this is going to represent a big part of our business going forward. And, and, and I'm aware that, you know, quite early on, you formed a, a, a relationship with, you know, one of the world's sort of leading brands when it comes to, to putting on events and publishing. Um, tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing with, with Informer and what they've been doing with the platform. Yeah, so we've we've always had a very good relationship with Informer. Um, they're always sort of quite ahead of the game on 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 thinking about sort of how events should be uh, from a technological perspective. Uh, we approached them very early on with our ideas, and we, we this was very much a hand holding experience through the development phase where we we worked with them, you know, and fundamentally we're we're designing something for them. So they've launched their own uh, version of Totem called Connect Me, completely white labeled. Um, product um, and has you know, specific features on it as well that only they have. Um, uh, and I think, you know, just 
clients with open minds who have the understanding of, of what's going to happen in the future. And, and the fact that everything's changed, you know, it has changed for good. Things will move back and we, we all need that to happen. And, and there's nothing better than a physical face-to-face -face event. It, it, there's a time and a place. But we need to understand that, that, you know, for even ESG reasons, businesses are sort of putting the brakes on flights and the, sort of their corporate responsibility exactly. programs. They've also enjoyed a lot of savings from, from, from COVID of having to sort of fly people around. So I think maybe the model for some big organizations will, where they would have bought 20 or 30 places, they might be buying 10 and they might be going, well, we'll, we'll buy 20 virtual passes with that. And it's, it's, it's up to the, <clears throat> and I don't think the virtual passes should be cheap. You know, I, th I think you should be giving a really good service and charging a lot of money for it because it, you're still giving access to amazing content, the ability yeah. to network, you know, you, you're just choosing maybe a different use of your time, you know, and, and but I still want to get the value of what I'm doing. And, and, and arguably, the only thing that people are really sacrificing is, is the six hours in the bar and the massive hangover the next day <laughs> the, in the evening of the event, which if you're a company sending your staff to a to an event like that traditionally, you know, you're actually benefiting massively, aren't they? Because you've got them potentially in their office or in their place yeah. of work where they would usually be anyway. They still have the capability of maybe diving in and out of sessions and, and doing some work at the same time. Whereas not only have you got that cost of sending somebody physically to an event in the past, whether that be a drive down the M1 or a flight over to the States, um, you've also got the associated costs, but there's also the lost working time that I, yeah. I think a lot of people don't factor into the cost of doing it is the fact that not only is that three days at that event costing you, but that person is also not doing their regular work over those three days. There's a huge opportunity cost to that, you know, and and uh, I think I think I think people realise that in the same way that you know I think anybody that was resistant to whether home working worked, you know, who now has seen that oh, nothing went wrong, you know, and look, it's incredible <laughs> that nothing went wrong, the lights didn't go off, you know, was water still came out of the taps, everything still happened, you know, um, and I think. It's the same for the virtual events. I think people really now understand that there is a value to it. You can get the information you want. Networking is always challenging, but I think there's some great things out there to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think there will be blended audiences um, for, for the foreseeable future. And I think it's only going to get more and more. Um, something else I'd like to, to talk about today that I was uh, I became aware of just doing a bit of reading as, as I do prior to prior to these recordings is that you've already spoken about how Informer have adopted the Totem platform and, and, and branded it in their own way as Connect Me. So it's white label, it's, you know, it's, it's bespoke for them. Um, and you've done something similar, I think, for the for the sort of pharmaceutical science medical industries, which, again, has represented a huge proportion of the live events industry in terms of the corporate world that, you know, pharmaceutical conferences are, are global events attended by thousands of people and arguably is one of the markets that potentially suffered and or benefited the most from the ability to host events online. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we looked at the sort of events as a whole and we were trying to see if there was just like a one fit solution platform, we think Totem covers pretty much, you, know, you could do anything on it. Um, but one vertical stood out to us that actually needed its own specific technology and some certain bits around it. Uh, so we, we actually this week just launched SciMed, which is a, uh, it's based on the architecture of Totem, but it's purely aimed at the science and medical profession. Um, and they need to to have lots and lots of meetings that, you know, to get a drug to market is an incredibly time, uh, time uh, using thing and it, uh, you need to get hundreds of people together constantly throughout the year yeah. um, and not necessarily face to face it doesn't have to have to happen that way so uh, what we've done is we've created um, some a suite of technologies specifically for that market so that people can run their their uh, investigator meetings their advisory boards there's very specific things in there where you can create bespoke schedules for groups of people and stuff that's very important for that those training meetings etc um, and that launches this week. So, but that's the only vertical we really saw that needed its own sort of lifeblood, its own technology, and its own sort of part. And there's compliance built into the platform too, because it's sure. this yeah. very heavily compliance led. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, I've already seen examples of of where this, you know, this hybrid, virtual, call it what you will, these platforms are basically. Um, improving the efficiency of the decision making process within these vertical markets and within these these business environments because they can have more meetings more frequently 
you know, they can do frequent short meetings. Whereas, you know, to fly over to, to Tokyo, to San Francisco, you know, for, for a five minute meeting just wouldn't be practical. Um, so I, I see sort of other benefits to there. And, and it's interesting where we've seen in the space of 12 months, vaccines be developed and be deployed. You know, it'd be interesting to see sort of further on in that particular vertical market, how more productive, how much more productive they can be by the ability to stage meetings very, very quickly. Look at, I mean, we, we always think about the delegate journey, sort of traveling and stuff. But if you look at the kind of the speaker journey or your professional people who are presenting and the content, your, your access to excellence has increased massively because mm. it's not the biggest time. Of, you know, you could you fly some? Do I have time to go and talk to somebody and fly me across the world if I was a speaker at an event? No, but can I give you an hour of time? Yeah, for sure. So getting people that you need around for your sessions and stuff, and you know, just breaking down those silos of quick communication. Absolutely. Mm. It's interesting as well that, that already in 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 a rel and we've spoken about how quickly things can develop and there has been that pressure on companies like yourselves and other providers of, of event tech in the last 12 months to develop things very, very quickly. They've had a lot of clients coming to them saying, we want to do this. Can you sort something for us? And I'm sure you've had instances like that as well. And, and um, Reef, I think, is, is something that, that you guys are developing at the moment, which is another sort of, I don't know not whether you'd call it an offshoot to Totem, but somewhere where people can actually go in between events and maintain a sort of a dialogue and a, and a contact. Yeah, so if we think about why events were created in the beginning, you know, and why I'd say um, there were two day or there were three day events, they were the best use of all those people's time to come together and do one thing. If we look at the possibilities now where, you know, you can break an event up, it could have been a two day event and it could be, you know, split over five days and made a shorter form in the days, anything has become possible. So the, the format and the, the, the way events can be constructed has fundamentally changed. So we don't need to think so event centric. We don't need to think about um, uh, events necessarily having to sort of start and end. So the reef is very much within a portfolio way of having a constant so your profile lives in the reef, you, uh, you have contacts in the reef, you can network, the client can advertise um, uh, future events to you in that space. Um, you go there for your post-demand media, sort of going back to a, a fully fledged environment to get you to watch your on-demand content is like going to an empty theme park, you know, everyone's left. So why would you digest it there? So reef is the constant area uh, that you can have 365 for your vertical. Uh, it keeps people engaged. You can push all your Marcoms there. You can put your post event media there. You can advertise your future events there. And yeah. people then just get a stickiness to, to come back. And uh, small events can live there. You can do streams in there. So it's just about you know, what's a big event, what's a small event. And maybe events on topic don't need to be a week. Maybe they're all year and you just come in and digest. Everyone's trying to move to a sort of more subscription model, you know. Well, that, that, that takes us full circle again, doesn't it? In terms of um, what we're talking about in venues and, and, and you know, operationally and logistically staging sure. a live event. You know, there's a reason why massive conferences and massive corporate events only take place once a year because the logistics involved in staging those are so intense and so complicated and people have to sacrifice their time and then they have to travel. There is clearly this market that's opening up for more frequent, smaller events. Yeah. Because yeah. if 10 people walked into the NEC, it would feel completely ridiculous. But if 10 people log into an online meeting, there's nothing strange about that. No. And you wouldn't know if there were 10,000 people watching that stream as well as you sat in your own office. And there's a, it takes us back to this scalability, doesn't it? Being able to do things more frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Also, to just give better value. I mean, if you go to an expo with 10,000 people, only a portion of what's going on there is going to be relevant to you. Whereas you could spin up an event for 10 or 15 people. And if you've got the right buy side sell there, you're going to have a very rewarding event. And it's going to be achieved at a very limited cost. So I think the value chain has been completely sort of swapped around. And uh, I, yeah, I think the smaller events, more niche, more spoke, more bespoke, laser focused. And with all the measurability you have online, you know, and all the tailoring and personalization, it's just, yeah, it's a no brainer. It's, it's, it's interesting. Of um, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on a, a platform that everybody's familiar with, something uh, LinkedIn, um, because that they've, They've they've taken steps in in the last year to try and 
I wouldn't say maybe gets a, a slice of the pie of, of the virtual events world, but they, they've done little things here and there to see if they can make it work. And something that, that struck me when I've looked at it is if I look at my own LinkedIn profile, I've got people that I've been connected with probably for 15, 16 years, going back to the earliest days of LinkedIn, that have absolutely nothing to do with my work today because I was doing a completely different job that time, you know, that long ago. Um, and it's a really sort of fragmented connection network that I've got. So if I did want to put anything out there related to events, it would only relate to a proportion of my contacts in there. And I feel that that's perhaps where LinkedIn is, dare I say, not, not becoming obsolete, but maybe becoming a little bit messy. Yeah, I mean, abs yeah, so from the same uh, hymn sheet again, it's, um, it's a very... I think it's a victim of its own success and obviously covid it became the only channel for people to, to market really you know it, it, as people were just pouring money into it pouring like comms into it and it just became a massive echo chamber uh, mm -hmm. you know whereas i used to probably log on and appraise whether i was going to connect or not yes no blah blah there's some messages read the messages it's just like Wah! you know and you just end up ignoring it and it becomes a little bit obsolete as you say so i, I do think there's a very there's a very good place in the market for a sort of laser precisioned, you know, professional network. Um, and I think this is this is where areas like, for example, the reef and, and other systems and stuff out there um, um, can win because they're just going to provide something that's relevant and timely and more focused and less noise. Uh, so people can get their jobs done. They can look at their professional, you know, their training, their qualifications, even jobs and just just sort of do it in a more sort of tailored field. As you say, how much of that noise is relevant to your profession and your job now? Mm. We, we've we've spoken already about a couple of you know the the reef uh, and 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 the the Cymed, um, sort of offshoots, if you will, of of Totem. But fundamentally, as a platform, um, having put all that effort in last year to bring it to market, are you happy with it as it stands? Um, we spoke right at the beginning of today's podcast about how simplicity is so important from a, an operational point of view for the user, for the client that's that's going with it. How happy are you with Totem at the moment and where would you see it going in the next 12 months? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess everyone would say this if it's your own platform, but yeah, we're really happy with it. Um, we do have an analogy internally with dev and design, which is, it's like a bridge. You sort of paint the bridge and by the time you get to sort of the other side, you're coming back again, you know? <laughs> So it's, it's constantly evolving. It, it's very responsive. We, we have a rapid prototyping approach to our design as well as our tech. So we have idea clinics, which we we, we, we kill our, or, or press the button on ideas really quickly. And we test them out. And if, you know, if they're well received, we, we, we go further into that. And if they're not, we just pull them. Um, but yeah, we've got used to a very fast pace of development. It's, it's always easy to try and concentrate on a shiny new toy or a shiny new piece of tech. So we're trying to keep the whole platform holistic. So you, there's a nice feeling to it and a familiar feeling to it. And that's quite hard to keep that that sense going. But you sure. know, we're yeah. happy with it. And, and I think the, the evolution really is about bringing in the reef and bringing in the other aspects, the, the, the app for the, the, the hybrid events, so the physical guests. We built a remote, basically what we're calling the remote control for the, the, the physical guests. So they've got the remote control to the events. They can do all their polling natively inside it. They can communicate vice versa with everybody. But you still have, from the organizers' the perspective, the ultimate sort of god power of turning every single element off. So you can protect your ticketing. You can protect your pricing. It might be that the virtual guests can't network or you want them to network. So everything's very granular. You can literally turn every element on and off. And, uh, um, but to answer your question, yeah, we're, we're super happy and it's just a, an evolution as we go. No, it's, it's, um, it's, it's clearly been put together with, you know, a, a, a bit of common sense thought process behind it. Um, and, and I don't mean that to the detriment of other platforms that are out there, but there are a lot that uh, are all things to all men or trying to be that can be overly complicated. And we're using, for example, we're using the StreamYard, um, you know, cloud platform to do this podcast today. I started using this at the start of this year. It took me about 20 minutes to get up and running with yeah, it because I built something that was intuitive. Oh, you click that and it displays a logo. Great. I click that and it shows me another camera angle. Lovely. Oh, I can play a video clip. Great. It says video clip. You know, that that's to me an example of a platform that's thought, right, 
let's keep it nice and simple. Let's make it intuitive. They're the best ones. You know, the, 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 they're always the ones that then take off, I think, are the ones that... Yeah, they roll nicely awesome. too. The, their feature sets, they roll out are really good. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a company that really knows what they're doing. Um, yeah. And there's lots of them. They're all, you know, there's, there's lots of bits out there that are, which are really good. Um, so, yeah, I just think there's, there's spaces in markets with different things. The event all, the industry is huge, you know, and, you know, it's, uh, it's you, you can't have one platform like for everybody, it's it's just yes. you know, for clients to choose. Well, this is the thing that the final point I, I, I'll make today is, is 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 in terms of client exploration. You know, I know it's a minefield out there, but if you are an organizer and you are looking for a platform to to run your event virtually or hybrid, call it what you will, it is so important now to go out there and do that exploration and plan that research time in because. You know, certain platforms have been built with their own client base in mind, and that client base might be for a certain industry, in which case that platform has been built to function in a certain way. It might be that another platform has been built because predominantly their clients work in a completely different industry, and it may have been built with other functionality involved. So it is important that it's not just saying, right, here's six different options, because all of those six different options could present something, you know, totally different. And I think client exploration is the key here and a willingness from clients to... Um, to really yeah. go in deep and, and understand what they want from it. Yeah, I totally agree. And and our model isn't, you know, we took a decision very early on that we wouldn't do an off-the-shelf model. So you, you can't just buy this off the shelf and, and run a single event. We do have an agency attached to it, which we, we run events for you on the platform, but we're working with larger clients over portfolios of events to solve a solution for them where we tailor it with them and for them and they get to own their sort of their own trajectory on that. So that's our place in the market. That's what we're, that's the, you know, the clients we're trying to win are the people who are looking at, you know, you know, a 10 year journey and evolution with their, this, this strategy they're trying to unfold and that, you know, just to, to win it, win it together. Uh, and that's happening already. We've got a great relationship with our founding clients and, uh, you know, we just want to make sure we keep building on that and, you know, not, not take too much on too quickly and make sure that we, you, we provide the service we said we do. Absolutely. We've been talking on the podcast today to Christopher Bow Shields, the Chief Creative Officer and Co-Founder of Totem. As we mentioned earlier on, um, a, a big working relationship with Informa at the moment. So if any of our podcast listeners uh, and followers, you know, uh, attend or experience any any events being run by Informa, I'm sure you may well have experience of the the, the Connect uh, Me platform that they're doing that, that, that was powered by Totem. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear from anybody is, is, is uh, if you've had that experience and, and I'm sure people need to sort of keep a keen eye on what's what's happening with that. Chris, before we go today, um, if people want to find out a little bit more about Totem, if they want to see what you guys are up to on a, a day-to-day basis, how do they how do they follow you or get in touch? Uh, just uh, go to totemhybrid.com, uh, fill in the form. We'll come straight back to you and we can arrange a demo. Fantastic. Um, if you are watching today's uh, video version of the podcast on the eventindustrynews.com website, don't forget to go to your favorite podcast platform and you can listen to audio versions of all of our previous podcasts up to about 250 or so episodes now going right back over the last few years. Of course, if you are listening to today's podcast while you're out and about, hello to you. And don't forget that when you're back at your laptop or, or sat down with a cup of coffee on your iPad, hop over to eventindustrynews.com. You can see video versions of all of our podcasts as well and uh, you can also check out the latest news features supplements and what's going on in the various strands of the industry whilst you're on the event industry news com website and that brings us to the end of today's episode of the podcast our thanks once again to christopher bow shields from totem my name's james dixon signing off for this time and we'll see you on the next episode goodbye mm-hmm.